This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Well, aloha everybody. The day before uh, Thanksgiving Day, and uh, my name is Mitch Hewan. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. In my day job, I'm the hydrogen systems guy at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So, um, one of the things I'm trying to do in this series is to uh, show off uh, really interesting research development demonstration that we're doing at uh, HNEI, the University of Hawaii. Try and show the general public who actually ultimately help pay for all of this that they're getting some good value for their money. We're doing good things for Hawaii that will help us achieve our clean energy goals. And so I kind of feature our researchers that are doing some really neat stuff. And today I'm really uh, pleased to have N Nicolas uh, Gaillard from France, uh, commonly known as Nico around HNEI. And uh, Nico's been with us for uh, quite a long time, and he's doing work in uh, photovoltaics, mm -hmm. PV. I mean, a lot of you people out in the audience probably have PV arrays on your roof and supplementing or offsetting or maybe even covering all of your energy requirements. So uh, I've invited um, Nico, and he kindly agreed to appear to talk about some of his interesting projects. And uh, first of all, I want to ask him a few questions about his background. So first of all, Nico, welcome on board. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Thanks for Thanks coming. A lot, of course, it's uh, it's uh, really a challenge sometimes to find people that uh, are willing to come on the show um, because they're so busy, you know, and it's like it takes time. So first of all, uh, give us a little bit of uh, information or about your background, where you're from, and sure. uh, what's your expertise, yep. and what did you do before you came to Hawaii? So I'm originally from France. I grew up in a city called Grenoble, Grenoble. It's at the bottom of the Alps in France. So it's the city that hosted the Olympic Games in '68. The home of Jean-Claude Killing, That's exactly right. right. Awesome That's exactly skier, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a beautiful place surrounded by mountains, and it's a very, it's a great place uh, right. to grow up. And so I did all my studies um, in this city. Uh, my first um, set of um, studies were to become a technician. Actually, it was a very short uh, cycle, only two years. And then I had the chance to enter the National Graduate School of Physics. Oh, really? And uh, for three years, and I studied microelectronics and nanotechnologies uh, to right. become uh, an engineer in physics. So nanotechnology, is that long ago, was it? I mean, was that still coming up? Oh, yeah, it's still really relevant to, to what we do, whether it's catalysis or whether it's, it's a, you know, solar cells, nanotechnologies, right. it's present everywhere these okay. days. Yeah. And then I moved to Japan to do my master, working for Nippon Telegraph and Telecom. So I was doing, yeah. again, nano, nanotechnologies and nanodevices. Very good. Came back to France to do my PhD uh, in a private firm that actually makes uh, microchips for computers and phones. So dealing with uh, you know fabs, these right. gigantic fabs where you process wafers and, and make and make transistors. Yeah. And then I decided that I wanted to move away from France right. for a short while. We okay. turned out to be eleven years now. Right. Uh, first as a postdoctoral fellow. And then eventually. So, what, the, what does a postdoctoral fellow mean for those of us who are not so a postdoctoral fellow is someone who just finished his PhD, right, and wants to gain experience in different labs. Okay. So usually, when you do a postdoctoral fellowship, you do multiple fellowships right. to gain experience and maybe return in your home country okay. uh, to become a professor. And I just decided to do one and decided that Hawaii was my base. So, so why did you decide Hawaii? What was the, the attraction? Apart, I love, apart from the great waves. Because I love surfing. That's pretty much the reason why really? I'm here. Yeah, yeah, that's what brought me here that's in the first reason, place. Yeah. And as it turns out, uh, University of Hawaii and HNI was dealing with the same type of uh, technologies as what I was doing for the microelectronic industry. Right. That's pretty much the same processes. Um, and so I just called and, and stopped by and, and asked for a job. So I think our boss, like Rick Roshlow, is now the director of... Uh, HNEI. That is correct. He set, did, did he set up the original lab? Or? So he set up the original lab, yeah. uh, but when I joined HNEI, Eric Miller was actually right. leading the group, yeah. and then he left uh, for DC, and I, I took over the okay. lab uh, 10 so, years ago now. So just for the audience, I mean, didn't we have like pretty well world, some world-class technology that we developed here? We did. We well, did. And we talk have, a little bit about that? We have patents. So back in the late 90s, 90, 1998, um, HNEI um, filed for a patent 
for uh, a device that can produce solar fuels out of sunlight and uh, water. So, hang on. Yeah. What's a solar fuel? So a solar fuel is essentially a fuel that's been created by a material right. that can absorb light and drive a chemical reaction. So essentially what you do with the solar fuel is that you store light energy by breaking and making chemical bonds. Okay. And you store these solar fuels. One of them could be hydrogen, for example. Once right. you make hydrogen, you can store the hydrogen, right. transport it, and eventually reuse it into a fuel cell to get the electricity back. So it's a mean of storing energy. Okay, so yeah. it's a fuel or a substance that's been created out of a solar renewable mm -hmm. energy source. That is correct. Or a solar source. That is correct. Hey, great stuff. So um, I understand you've uh, brought some slides along. You I do. You can even see some samples yep. of some of the work that you have here arrayed on the table. Mm -hmm. And so um, people aren't here to hear me talk, but uh, to, to listen to you. And, uh, and, and I understand, and I've seen your slides, so I think they're uh, very good for a layman-type mm -hmm. audience. So why don't we uh, you know, mount up uh, some of uh, Nico's slides, and we can just yep. talk to them and sure. tell us what we're seeing. Sure. So... In my group at HNEI, we work on a lot of different type of structures right. uh, that we call either thin films or nanostructures. We have multiple projects, but um, just for today, I've decided to focus on two very different technologies that are um, quite important for renewable hydrogen, renewable energy production and storage. So the first one is uh, what we call printable photovoltaics, mm -hmm. and it's a method that we developed to uh, lower the manufacturing cost and find a high throughput method to make photovoltaics. So I'm going okay. to talk about that. Okay. Uh, and the other method, so this program is supported by the Office of Naval Research. Right. And the second topic is uh, the solar fuels. So right. how can you make a solar material absorbing light and breaking and forming chemical bonds to again store solar energies okay. into chemical bonds. So that will be the two topics that we're going to cover today. Okay. So let's have the next slide. Sure. So just to give you um, an idea of uh, the global energy sector and, and the demand versus uh, the resources, if you look at worldwide, um, the world consume about 20 terawatt of, um, power, of, ener of power every year. So 20 terawatt is 20 with 12 zeros right after. So it's a huge amount of energy. And if you look at the the countries that actually consume the most, the first one uh, will be China with 5.3 terawatt. And right in second place, we have the US with right. 4 terawatts. So it's quite a large number um, of, of power. And China has population measuring in the billions. Yeah, so you can, if you rate that to the number of habitants, yeah. it's quite a lot for the it's US. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. The US. And so that just combine everything, oil, electricity, it's a, okay. it's a, global, right. it's a global number. So now if you just look at the renewable resources that we have uh, worldwide, you'll find that every year you get about four terawatt of wind blowing at the surface of the earth. So if you were to convert that wind with wind turbine, you would get about four terawatts. Okay. From biomass, you would get about five terawatts. Mm -hmm. From geothermal, one. Okay. And from solar, 120,000 terawatts. Wow. That's a so lot. So that's the huge resource out That's there. a huge resource. Right. And the game is how can you harvest that energy, produce it, use it, and store it. Okay. So that's really what we're trying to do here. So these numbers are, are pretty big, right. but to give you some sort of a, a better idea, um, you could think, for example, that every hour, the sun outputs on Earth enough energy to power the world for a year. Wow. You're so by the, end, by the end of this show, there's going to be probably enough solar power that reaches the Earth that could be used to power the world for a year. Wow. It's huge. Yeah, that it's is huge, yeah. And if you just want to compare that, you know, to the, to the U.S. and that four terawatt what we need, that yeah. we need, uh, the area required to capture four terawatts of electricity per year um, is a square of 150 mile by 150 mile. Is that all? Yeah, so it's about 0.5% of the U.S. territory. Wow. So if you can show the slide number two again, you'll see that that represents about half of the desert in Nevada, at the bottom, yeah. yeah. So it's not oh, a whole I lot. I see, yeah. Yeah, it's not a whole lot. That's amazing. So obviously this is you know, centralized. In reality, right. you need to dispatch this electricity. So you would have uh, 
you know, homeowners having PV or you could, you could have centralized power plants. Okay. But just to give you a sense of scale, that's just how much you need okay. to power the US. And that would be transportation, everything, that would be everything, everything we use. Everything we use. Wow. Yeah, yeah. everything it's, we use. And it's clean energy too. And it's clean energy. Yeah, yeah. very good. So let's uh, look at the next slide. Yeah, so the next slides um, show you the different technologies that are available these days. So if you look at the PV market share, Mm -hmm. About 90% of the market is um, led by crystalline silicon, which is the standard mm -hmm. PV metal that we are all familiar with. If you look at, let's call that 100% of the PV modules installed in Hawaii yeah. by homeowners, these would be the crystalline silicon. So I got some samples here, which show you a silicon solar cell. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a device that's about, let's call that three inch by three inch. Yeah. Um, and so that's one unique solar cell. And in a module, usually you have all these solar cells in series okay. with uh, interconnection between them to capture the electricity produced by every single one of these, right. of these so cells. So it's fairly fragile on its own, I guess. It is very fragile. Um, as I a matter of fact, a yeah, I, sh I show you uh, another one, and, and that's going to bring me to the next uh, topic. But yeah, the, the main drawback with the silicon technology is that it's a great electronic materials, yeah. but it's not such a great solar absorber. Okay. And to be able to capture pretty much all the photons in the solar spectrum, you need a fairly thick silicon wafer, about a millimeter thick. Right. So these are very rigid, yeah. quite heavy. They need to be framed with a very sturdy uh, frame right. with, a, with a piece of glass sitting on top. And, and so for um, local production, and stationary friction, this is just fine. Okay. But as you can see, you cannot bend these things, otherwise they would just break and shatter right. in your fingers. Um, so that's the reason why there is another type of technology, and that's the technology I'm working on with my group in the lab, which is called thin films. Okay. If you want to go back to the slide. And so the thin films, um, the market share is about 10%. I see, yeah. So you do have company who tries to make thin films for large scale uh, PV. Okay. Plants. Right. Uh, first solar is one in the US. They make what we call camion telluride uh, thin film modules. Okay. But really, the main advantage of the thin films is that because they are such a great solar absorber, you don't need a millimeter thick solar absorber okay. to capture light. Only a micron, which is about a hundredth the size of human hair. Okay, so I'm looking at this picture in the bottom left hand corner. You see some sol soldiers, I guess they're erecting a tent that's covered with uh, this thin film. Exactly. And they're actually standing, they're standing, on, it. They're yeah. standing on the thin yeah. film stuff, yeah. and you can see it's all wrinkled and like, it's correct. totally yeah. flexible. So it's totally flexible. It's actually as flexible as the substrate. Really? So what you have here is a thin film solar cell on a metal foil, okay. and all the rigidity of the solar cell comes from the foil itself. I see. The foil is required as a substrate, mm -hmm but you don't need the foil technically okay. to make technically, the solar cell yeah. work. So you could imagine that you could deposit that on cloth, if you can, right. on plastics, mm -hmm. if the temperature allows it. Um, and you can make all sorts of different solar devices. So you see, for example, here, um, as you mentioned, solar cells on, on cloth. All the, what I call the wearable PV, so when you see solar panels on backpacks, yeah. usually these are thin films as well. They're simply stitched onto the backpack. And all the way on the right hand side of these slides, you have what we call building integrated PV. Right. Um, so you could have these flexible solar cell either glued on top of the roof. Right. So you pretty much peel, uh, peel the backing and plate and, and stick it onto the, yeah. um, the building. Or you can make semi-transparent solar cells. What you can see here is that the light is actually going through the solar cell and the shadow that you see is the light that's being transmitted. So you see some red, some blue. Yeah, some I was going to ask, colors. why Why is it? Why do we have all the multi-different colors there? Is that just the breakdown of the spectrum? That is exactly right. Okay. So we're going to talk about that in a few slides, is when you want to make a highly efficient solar cell, you don't want just a single solar absorber that right. will capture light only in a fraction of the solar spectrum. Right. You want to stack the solar cell. You want to make what I call an optical funnel yeah. with a solar cell that can capture blue photons, Mm -hmm. solar cells that can capture red photons and solar cells that can capture infrared photons. I and see. that's a better way to capture light and to boost the efficiency of these solar okay. cells. So tuning the color of 
the solar absorber is really what we do on a daily basis is being able to control the color and okay. their conversion efficiency. So you'll see some, some okay. picture there. On. So like on the next slide, yeah, so what are we going to see next? What's next is, yeah, so how do we make these solar cells? So the standard crystalline silicon cells actually come from an ingot of silicon. Which is, is like sand. So you start with sand, you melt the silicon, you melt the quartz of the sand, right. uh, and there is some chemical reactions with, uh, I believe, graphite to extract the oxygen from the silicon oxide, which okay. is sent to, to end up with the pure silicon element. Right. And then what you do out of that is on top of that molten pool of silicon, you put a very small seed of silicon in contact with the liquid. And as you pull the seed very slowly away from the liquid, the liquid that's stuck on the seed will crystallize. Right. And as you go, you're going to form that large ingot. So just by pulling, right. if you want to show the, the slide again, that very big salami of silicon was right. actually hanging from the, from the left-hand side. You have a little, yeah, tip, yeah, a little tip there. Yeah. And was pulled very slowly from wow. the silicon melt. Making an ingot like that takes about three to four weeks. So it uses a lot of energy too. It does. It took about yeah, thousands melting, of degrees. You're melting glass. Exactly. Or melting sand. Yeah. Exactly. Twenty-four-seven for four weeks. Right. Exactly. So once you get that ingot, you can slice the ingot into wafers. So I got one here, which is, which was part of that ingot and was yeah. cut with a special saw, and then it's polished to right. the atomic level. Yeah. So there's not a single atom that pokes through that layer. Oh, no it's kidding, atomically really? flat. Yeah. And then you cut that wafer. Furthermore, into squares because you want to be able to pack as many solar cells as you can. So a circular yeah. shape is not ideal. And then you build a couple more layers on top, and you get your, your oh, crystalline silicon cell. But again, yeah. very rigid, uh, quite heavy, and you need a, that much Let me silicon. See how heavy yeah. That is. Oh yeah. That is you need heavy. that much silicon to absorb wow. photons. Yeah. So yeah. great electronic material. Yeah. Not so great for photovoltaics, except if you make it thick. So, kind of what's the lifespan of some of this materials? I mean, you know, you see uh, warranties for like 20, 25 years. Is that it? That's about it, yeah. 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 So, I think they would warranty a decline in power for about a person per year for 20 to 25 years. Yeah. After that, um, I'm, I can't really tell you whether or not it's going to drop at 5 or 10% or if it's yeah. going to continue at that degradation rate. Uh, but, you know, you, you see some very old solar panels out there. Um, yeah. For the early solar water heating system, mm -hmm. you would see these round silicon wafers as the main solar panel to drive the pump. Oh, really? And they've yeah. been around, I mean, these were probably made in the late oh, really? 70s or 80s. So, so can you still recycle around. it? I mean, can you like melt it down again and re redo it? So yeah. you kind of save something. You can. In, you in can. The process. Yeah. yeah. It's so we have a lot of PV panels here on a rooftop in Hawaii. Yep. They're going to start coming up to, I guess they got a few years to go before they hit their 20, 25 year life. But yep. at some point, these are all going to be, have to be replaced. And they're yep. going to have to be recycled. And recycled. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, do you want to replace them with the same technology? Or upgrade. Like the 40 yeah. of, of PV, which was the silicon maybe, you know, 50 years ago, which yep. is what we use. Or do you want to move to new technologies, uh, thin films? or quantum yeah. dots based solar cells. I mean, there is a lot of very interesting technologies that, that come out there. Okay. And silicon has been the king, again, because all the processes that we use to make silicon cells were actually developed for and by the microelectronic industry. Yeah. So all the infrastructure and the know-how was there. Right. But as we progress, if you just look at the, the efficiency of silicon over the past five years, it's been pretty much at the same plateau. So it's, it's kind of like incremental. Mm -hmm. progress that we make, whereas you have other technologies that are just booming and, and we get gain in efficiency of several percent over a few years. So, which means a lot. Which means a lot. A few percent means a lot. So we're coming up to our time for a break. So Kay. we'll take a break now and then we'll come back and talk to Nico some more. And uh, he's got some more magic to show yep. us. So thanks very much. Thank and you. Let's talk to you after the break. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, harder every morning, do what we can. Minasan, konnichiwa. Think Tech Hawaii ga 
日本語でお届けする「こんにちはハワイ」の日本語放送のホスト国末ゆかりです各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組ですこんにちはハワイ各週の月曜日2時からぜひ皆さん見てくださいホストの国末ゆかりでしたアロハいやお願いします Okay, here we are back from our break, and、uh, here we are with Nico, and he's got some more magic standing by. So let's see some of this magic on his.、Uh, we're going to go back to the slide、yep. we、uh, were on just before the break. Okay. So, the second type of technology that's available out there for photovoltaics, in complement with the crystalline silicon, is what we call the thin films. Right. And so, these thin films, again, are About a hundredth of the thickness of human hair, so it's extremely thin. They don't, they don't need to be that thick to be good solar absorber.、Right. And the method that we use in my lab and also in other labs to make thin films is to use what we call a vacuum chamber.、Mm -hmm. So, what you see on the bottom left is the actual vacuum chamber that we use in my lab. At the very bottom, you have crucibles、okay. that you can heat up、yeah. and you put、uh, metals in these crucibles. And on the top part, you have the substrate. And by sublimating, Heating up these metals with the crucibles, you form a vapor、mm -hmm. of element that eventually condenses on the substrate.、Okay. And so you can control the thickness of the film, the temperature, and grow thin films for our cell this way.、Okay. So the common denominator between the crystalline silicon technology and the thin film technology is that they both rely on complex processes to make highly pure and highly crystalline solar absorber.、Okay. This is really the key. And usually that requires. Either extreme, extreme vacuums or very high temperatures,、mm -hmm. long processes, complex、uh, techniques. And so, what we want to do in my lab is to think of a different method to try to make solar cells in a cheaper way, easier way, and even faster way.、Right. And so, that's what I'm showing on the next slide. So, what we want to do is It falls into the realm of printable electronics. And we want to find m e t h o d to actually print the solar cells, like you would print newspapers the same、right. way.、Okay. Uh, but instead of using the vacuum chamber, you would just roll the substrate and print with an inject printer、uh, your solar cell. And that's, that's the technology that we developed at, at UH in my lab. So you start with an ink、mm -hmm. that contains the solvent and the raw element that you want, the, the chemicals.、Okay. Yeah. And we essentially spin coat or print this onto a substrate to build up a, a layer. And just by doing a very quick, about 15 minute、uh, annealing in a specific atmosphere. So, annealing is like putting it in a heat chamber. Exactly. And fixing it, drying it out. Exactly. Okay. We, that way, form a crystal,、okay. which is in some cases as good, even sometimes better in terms of crystal size as the material we would get in a vacuum chamber. So, we we're very, getting very close to the quality of、wow. film that you would get in, in a vacuum chamber. So, is this a special kind of printer?、Uh, did you have to design that, or can you just use like normal inkjet? So,、cartridges? some folks in, in research lab they actually modify inkjet printers.、Um, really? You have to tune the print head because the ink tends to dry up and、okay. it's very difficult to, to remove the, the clog.、Right. But it's, it's pretty much the same technology, yeah?、Okay. It's pretty much the same. That's、yeah. fascinating. Yeah. 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 And so, what you see on the bottom left is the ink. That we、yeah. form, so it's very clear and very stable. We can store that ink for up to a year.、Yeah. And the gray image on the bottom center is actually a cross section of the solar cell. And we you take that picture using an electron microscope. Exactly. Right, which、so、we the, have at UH. We, we have at UH, exactly. So we can,、oh. do, we can do part of the analysis here、right. at UH. And so what you see on the cross section is at the bottom you have what we call the back contact.、Mm -hmm. On the top, the top electrical contact. And in sandwich in between, you have the thin film solar absorber. Which is again only a micron thick.、Right. And so, right now, the, the, the efficiency that we get out of these printed solar cells is around 7 to 9%.、Okay. To give you a point of comparison,、uh, a very good crystalline solar cell would give you up maybe to 25%.、Okay. A thin film s made in vacuum, maybe up to 22 23%. So, right now, we're about half to a third of the efficiency, but at a fraction of the cost.、Okay. So, it's always a trade off.、Right. Do you want raw power? Or do you want cheap?、Yeah. Ideally, you would b both.、Yes. We're not there yet.、Okay. But that's, that's one avenue to really reduce costs. 
and and print, for example, your sort of sell on clothing or, right. or or backpacks or, or oh, tarps. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, very good. So, that's, that's so we have a lot of wasted real estate that could be printed all over. That's right. Be generated. As long power. as you can face the sun, you're, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. that's so right. Don't build that big apartment building in front of me and yeah. shade, shade me out, right? <laughs> that's right. Okay, so let's have a look at your next slide. Yeah, so that was for the for the printable electronics and the, and the PV. Now we're going to move on in the solar fuels. Okay. Uh, so if you can show the next slides, the, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is abundant amount of solar energy, but as we know, this is an intermittent yes. source of energy. Uh, and unfortunately, the demand, which is mostly at night, is out of phase with, this, with the production, which is mostly during the day. So if you look at how much PV we have right now worldwide, it's about 1% or less because of that shift between the demand and, and the production. So being able to combine storage and PV is really the key to push solar okay. uh, energies into the, into the mix. And there is different way to store energies. The approach that we have in my group is to store solar energies into chemical bonds. So these are the solar fuels. Um, so this is a, a engineering uh, problem where what you have is a black box, which is the process mm -hmm. uh, that I'm going to define later. And as an input, you have water, which we have everywhere, right. mostly everywhere, and sunlight. And what you want outside of this black box are products. In our case, we are interested in hydrogen, right. H2, but you could form other types of, of fuels, uh, CH4 or other, other, okay. other fuels, even. Uh, by um, diesel that's, that's and so forth. That's natural gas, CH4, just so yeah, everybody knows. That's right. And so what you can do with this hydrogen is later on plug that into your hybrid car, okay. which runs, I'm sorry, on the fuel cell car, which runs uh, on hydrogen and, and drive around. Incidentally, we now are able to uh, lease hydrogen cars here in Hawaii from yep. Toyota, Servco. We have, uh, they just opened their station and just opened up for uh, leasing. Um, that is Marais, great. Marais, that's wonderful. Awesome? Yep. It has it's arrived. Finally. <laughs> finally. That's great. So. The picture that you see here is actually one of my coworkers that works yeah. at Livermore in California, and that's his right. own car. That's uh, his own car? Car, yeah. Oh, very good, yeah. So he gets, I think his best is 500 miles. No kidding. Yeah, You're 502 kidding miles out of one. Oh, awesome. On average, it's around 350, but he was able to push it to 500 miles. So, so it must like range. just coast down. Yeah, the, the, the game know? was really to get a, a record here. <laughs> That's great. If so, you can show the slide one more time, please. Yeah. Uh, so it's been always the chicken and the egg situation for hydrogen. Yeah. You need the infrastructure to get the car on the market, but to get the car, you need to have the, the station there. Yeah. So yes. it's always been the situation like that. However, there is a an industry that is in need for hydrogen is the food industry. Absolutely. And hydrogen is the main precursor in ammonia production, right. which is eventually used into fertilizer. And only in the US, we produce about 50 million tons of hydrogen just yeah. for the food industry. So let me make a comment here. Uh, I know a little bit about um, ammonia. If it wasn't for ammonia, uh, we would all be starving to death. We cannot support the world population that we have because it improves the productivity of the land by a factor of four. Wow. So you can grow four times as much food on a given acre of land than if you did not have ammonia as a fertilizer. Yeah. So pretty interesting. And very, very, yeah. very important product. Yeah. Oh, uh, we're not ready to wrap up yet, are we? Already? No. I mean, where'd the, where'd the time go? I don't know. We'll get some yeah, time. Yeah, some more slides. We can just like Yes, we can through. go. We can keep going. So on the, the next slide, you'll see the different methods that we have uh, these days to make uh, hydrogen. Either these are fossil fuel based, that would be steam methane reforming, yeah. or if you were to plug an electrolyzer straight to the grid, uh, okay. you can form hydrogen, but that's not the most renewable way right. to do it. What we want to do is to use renewable forms, uh, ideally from solar. So one way to do that would be to connect the electrolyzer to PVs. Uh, this is doable, but that's probably not the most straightforward way to do it. What the way we like to do is to have a device that can directly split water in contact uh, with an electrolyte when the sunlight uh, shines okay. on that material. And if you go to the next slide, um, that explains a little bit the process. So the idea is to somehow mimic uh, the natural photosynthesis and uh, try to make devices that can capture the light and create our fuels. Yeah, this, is, this has to be our last All slide right. because we're running out of time and it's, I'll it's come been back. like, so, yeah, I'll come I was back. just going to say, you need to come back yep. because this is really interesting. We can have like a, you know, 
Nico too. <laughs> Just Wasn't like that? one of those big movies. So Nico, once again, thank you so much sure. for taking time out of your busy day of and course. making you know making the trek downtown yep. and coming on our show. So appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Mitch. Best of Thanks luck in your me. program. Yep. You're doing great, cool stuff. I love the printing idea. That's okay. really neat. So that's uh, that's it for today. Uh, and. Um, we will be back uh, next week. I don't know if I can grab Nico next week, uh, maybe before everybody forgets what happened on this show. But um, for now, uh, we're going to sign off. And once again, uh, happy uh, Thanksgiving to everybody tomorrow. Yeah. So, it's aloha. Rich.